Wow. <laughs> I forgot my glasses until Powell's very kindly <laughs> gave me these glasses with which I can, I think I see my text, but I can't see you when I put them on. <laughs> so uh, I'll, there'll be a lot of on and off here. Uh, Will, how, how is the sound? There's a little chorus of chipmunks over there. <laughs> okay, now, how's this? <laughs> oh, God, this is awful. Uh, I'm, I'm used to uh, bifocals. See, when, when I look up, I can see people, and when I look down, I can't. But, uh, okay, how's that for sound? Okay. Um, the idea, I think, this evening is that I will read some, 15, 20 minutes, and um, then we'll do a little Q&A, and I can take my glasses off, <laughs> and then I sign books and sign books and sign books and sign books. <laughs> and I did ask tonight, please, even if you are a collector, even if you came from Kamchatka, <laughs> with 95 books in your suitcase, could we limit it to four tonight, please? Uh, it just gets really, really a little more than I can do sometimes. Okay. Um, I went to the salt beds at the mouth of the river in the May of my 19th year to get salt for the sacred meal. Tita and Maruna came with me and my father sent an old house slave and a boy with a donkey to carry the salt home. It's only a few miles up the coast, but we made an overnight picnic of it, loading the poor little donkey with food, taking all day to get there, setting up camp on a grassy dune above the beaches of the river and the sea. The five of us had supper round the fire and told stories and sang songs while the sun set in the sea and the May dusk turned blue and bluer. Then we slept under the sea wind. I woke at the first beginning of light. The others were sound asleep. The birds were just beginning their dawn chorus. I got up and went down to the mouth of the river I dipped up a little water and let it fall back as offering before I drank, saying the river's name, Tiber, Father Tiber, and his old secret names as well, Albu, Ruman. And then I drank, liking the half-salt taste of the water. The sky was light enough now that I could see the long, stiff waves at the bar where the current met the incoming tide. Out beyond that, on the dim sea, I saw ships. A line of great black ships coming up from the south and wheeling and heading into the river mouth. On each side of each ship, a long rank of oars lifted and beat like the beat of wings in the twilight. One after another, the ships breasted the waves at the bar, rising and plunging. One after another, they came straight on. Their long arched triple beaks were bronze. I crouched by the waterside in the salty mud. The first ship entered the river and came past me, dark above me, moving steadily to the heavy, soft beat of the oars on the water. The faces of the oarsmen were shadowed, but a man stood up against the sky on the high stern of the ship, gazing ahead. His face is stern, yet unguarded. He's looking ahead into the darkness, praying. I know who he is. By the time the last of the ships passed by me with that soft labored beat and rush of oars and vanished into the forest that grows thick on both banks, the birds were singing aloud everywhere and the sky was bright above the eastern hills. I climbed back up to our camp. No one was awake. The ships had passed them in their sleep. I said nothing to them of what I had seen. 
We went down to the salt pans and dug up enough of the muddy gray stuff to make salt for the year's use, loaded it in the donkey's baskets and set off home. I didn't let them linger and they complained and dawdled a little, but we were home well before noon. I went to the king and said, a great fleet of warships went up the river at dawn, father. He looked at me. His face was sad. So soon was all he said. I know who I was. I can tell you who I may have been, but I am now only in this line of words I write. I'm not sure of the nature of my existence and wonder to find myself writing. I speak Latin, of course, but did I ever learn to write it? That seems unlikely. No doubt someone with my name, Lavinia, did exist, but she may have been so different from my own idea of myself or my poet's idea of me that it only confuses me to think about her. As far as I know, it was my poet who gave me any reality at all. Before he wrote, I was the mistiest of figures, scarcely more than a name in a genealogy. It was he who brought me to life, to myself, and so made me able to remember my life and myself, which I do, vividly, with all kinds of emotions, emotions I feel strongly as I write perhaps because the events I remember only come to exist as I write them, or as he wrote them. But he didn't write them. He slighted my life in his poem. He scanted me because he only came to know who I was when he was dying. He's not to blame. It was too late for him to make amends, rethink, complete the half-lines, perfect the poem he thought imperfect. He grieved for that, I know. He grieved for me. Perhaps where he is now, down there across the dark rivers, somebody will tell him that Lavinia grieves for him. I won't die. Of that I'm all but certain. My life is too contingent to lead to anything so absolute as death. I have not enough real mortality. No doubt I'll eventually fade away and be lost in oblivion, as I would have done long ago if the poet hadn't summoned me into existence. Perhaps I'll become a false dream clinging like a bat to the underside of the leaves of the tree of the gate of the underworld, or an owl flitting in the dark oaks of Albunea. But I won't have to tear myself from life and go down into the dark as he did, poor man, first in his imagination, then as his own ghost. We each have to endure our own afterlife, he said to me once, or that's one way to understand what he said. But that dim loitering about down in the underworld, waiting to be forgotten or reborn, that's not true being, not even half true as my being is as I write and you read it. Nowhere near as true as in his words, the splendid, vivid words I've lived in for centuries. And yet my part of them, the life he gave me in his poems is so dull except for the one moment when my hair catches fire. (laughs) So colorless, except when my maiden cheeks blush like ivory stained with crimson dye. So conventional, I can't bear it any longer. If I must go on existing century after century, then once at least I must break out and speak. He didn't let me say a word. I have to take the word from him. He gave me a long life, but a small one. I need room. I need air. My soul reaches out into the old forests of my Italy, up to the sunlit hills, up to the winds of the swan and the truth-speaking crow, 
My mother was mad, but I was not. My father was old, but I was young. Like Spartan Helen, I caused a war. She caused hers by letting men who wanted her take her. I caused mine because I wouldn't be given, wouldn't be taken, but chose my man and my fate. The man was famous, the fate obscure. Not a bad balance. <laughs> All the same, sometimes I believe I must be long dead and am telling the story in some part of the underworld that we didn't know about, a deceiving place where we think we're alive, where we think we're growing old and remembering what happened when we were young, when the bees swarmed and my hair caught fire, when the Trojans came. After all, how can it be that we can all talk to one another? I remember the foreigners from the other side of the world sailing up the Tiber into a country they knew nothing of. Their envoy came to my father's house, explained that he was a Trojan, and made polite speeches in fluent Latin. Now how could that be? Do we all know all the languages? That can be true only of the dead, whose land lies under all the other lands. How is it that you understand me, who lived 25 or 30 centuries ago? Do you know Latin? But then I think, no. It has nothing to do with being dead. It's not death that allows us to understand one another, but poetry. So, uh, what to say about this book? That's how it begins. Uh, I was in my 70s and uh, I realized that if I was finally going to really learn Latin, which I had sort of learned a couple of times before and then forgotten, high school and graduate school, uh, I better get to it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I did. I, you know, I got out my old, uh, I have, sorry, my my high school book and also my graduate school book, and and they're good Latin grammars. And then there's some fine uh, younger books about you know teach yourself Latin in the modern sense. And so I waltzed around with that for a couple of years, and, and, but I know from other languages that the only way you learn a language is to read or hear it. And since one doesn't hear that much Latin, uh, I thought, oh well, what the hell, and I, I just got, uh, I came here to Powell's and got Virgil and uh, the Aeneid, and, Actually, I didn't start with the Aeneid. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, so I just dived in and, uh, okay, so, so I'm grinding along a year or so later, 10 lines a day, halfway through the Aeneid. And I've done all the, all the parts that we are kind of dimly familiar with, most of us, you know, with Dido and all that. And I got to the, the second half of the book, which is the part that we're not very familiar with, um, which is the, the battle part, the war part, when he gets to Italy, Aeneas does, and, and he has to, uh, to claim the, the wife and the kingdom that, he is, that his fates have told him he must claim. He finds he has to fight a war. Surprise, surprise, right? Uh, but there was this kid, there was this Lania, this, this Italian girl that he, he knows he has to marry her, she knows she has to marry him. Their oracles say so, and they're both people who listen to uh, things that are worth listening to, like oracles. So, uh, but what did she make of it all? 
So that's kind of where this novel is a riff on Virgil's Aeneid, I think is the best way to put it. Uh, I find that the interviewers that I've talked with all, they all want to talk about the feminism. And I'm kind of getting impatient because, yeah, I'm a feminist. I, you know, I've been a feminist ever since like the 80s. Yeah, you yeah. know. I, I have my feminist credentials. <laughs> I do not have to write another book to prove I'm a feminist, right? <laughs> I, I was kind of moving on from that. <laughs> well, it's not, e it's not easy. It's not easy to move on from feminism to which we really haven't got yet. <laughs> but what I wanted to, what, what I saw Virgil writing about and what I wanted to write about at least partly. I mean, all books are very complicated, and one thing doesn't cover it. But I, he, he wanted to write about war. He wanted to write about the price of empire. <laughs> so the other bit I'm going to read uh, needs a little background filling in. Uh, Latinus, the king of Latium, wants to obey the oracles, and he wants to marry his daughter, Lavinia, to the Trojan prince who just showed up, uh, looking for alliance. But his subjects, the Latins, they see the Trojans as invaders, and uh, they, they want a war. If, even if their king, both kings, the Latin and the Trojan, don't want a war, the people want a war. And Turnus, the local prince who wants to marry Lavinia, he's all for war. And he brings in some other Italian peoples, the Rutulians and the Volscians. So at this point, Aeneas, with his Etruscan allies, uh, has been driven into attacking and actually kind of whipping the Latins so far so that he is attacking Latinus's city itself. And this is Lavinia speaking as she does throughout the book. We went out and walked through the streets to the square where the shrine the protective spirit of the city stands. As we walked, women joined us coming out of every house, running down the streets. When we came to the place, there was a great crowd around us. My mother had walked ahead, and she lighted the incense, but it was I who had stood with the king before this altar a hundred times, and it was I who knew and spoke the words he used to speak, offering the people's duty and honor to the lar, the spirit and indwelling power of border and boundary, walled city, place of our people. The women around us bowed their heads or knelt down, and the people crowded into the streets and up the, on the walls and roofs fell silent listening. And I felt flow into me from them a loving trustfulness, a flood of feeling that humbled my mind and yet gave me a sense of great, reliable support. I was their daughter, their pledge to the future, a powerless girl, yet one who could speak for them to the great powers a mere token for political barter, yet also a sign of what was of true value to us all. I stood among my people in silence when the ritual was done, all of us, quiet as the birds that stand in hundreds at evening on the sea beach, seeming to worship together. <coughs> and so we could hear the noise outside the walls. Rumble and clash and crash, neighing and yelling and thunder of hooves and feet. The noise of an army making ready for war. The memory of the sweetness of that worship at the shrine of the law of the people was a solace and a shield to me in the dark time that followed. I found a kindness in the eyes of the men in the streets and the women of my household. They spoke my name tenderly. I felt welcome, protected. 
My home was my own again, even if it was under siege. I went to the king's apartment and talked with him very briefly. Haggard and aged, his eyes red and swollen, he told me to come to him with any news of great importance. Otherwise, to let him be, he wasn't well. I asked him to rest and sleep. Varus and I would meet the messengers, I said, and come to him if need arose. So I spent some of that day in the atrium at the, at the doors of the Regia, with Gaius and other men of the king's guard receiving couriers from the battlefield. There was a constant flow of men and news between the city and the fields in front of it, where the Volscians and the Latins <coughs> were taking up position for battle. Scouts reported that Aeneas had sent his horsemen and the Etruscans forward while he led the rest of his troops up into the hills northeast of the city. Varus said it looked as if his goal was to come at our army from two directions. So Turnus had taken his Rutulians up into the hills, intending to set an ambush for the Trojans at both ends of a pass. I knew the place, Golo Pass, the shepherds called it, a dark, narrow gorge. An army might well enter it and be trapped. Such news came to us steadily for a while. In the early or mid-afternoon, there was a pause, and leaving Varus in charge at our front doors, I ran up to my watchtower just for a look, I thought. I stood at the parapet to look out over the roofs and walls to the exercise grounds and fields north of the city. In several long, irregular lines beyond the earthworks stood the ranks of our Volscians with their black helmet crests, and behind them are Latins, very motley in their helmets and hand-me-down armor. Horses fidgeted, and their riders let them dance and curve it. Archers and men with long, light lances stood around in front of the Volscians, some fidgeting like the horses, others looking bored, leaning on their lances, chatting together. The watchtower had the widest view in the city, and we on it may have been the first to see the glint of light on the metal tips of lances far off over the fields in the north. A boy on a pony came scouring across the pastures, the pony white with lather, the boy yelling. I couldn't hear his words, but he was surely yelling, they're coming, and they came. It was very beautiful, the bristling glitter of lance heads far off there moving quickly, nearer and nearer. The air was shaken with the thrilling drum of the feet of horses at the gallop. All along the lines of men drawn up in front of the city, spears and lances reared up into the sunlight, and horses began to whinny and shift and fight the reins. Then the Etruscan horns and trumpets sounded their battle signals, some deep and hoarse, some silvery sweet. The attackers came on, the defenders stood firm. For a moment, everything seemed to stop, hold still. With a blare of the horns and a great shout of men's voices, arrows and javelins and lances went up from both sides, a swift darkness passing and crossing in the air between the two armies. <coughs> Under the iron rain, they met face to face, men afoot and horsemen, body to body. I tell you what I saw as I saw it, not understanding it. I saw men running towards the city, converging on the gate. I thought they were the attackers. I couldn't understand why they suddenly began turning around, running back towards other men who, when they met, fought them, swords rising and falling. <coughs> then men were running away from the city, holding their shields behind them as they ran, and mounted men and riderless horses ran with them, and other men followed them until suddenly those being chased turned around and the swords went up and down again and there was the horrible noise of men screaming. And it all happened over again. It was like sea waves approaching the city and washing back from it. But the spray was dust, thick, dark summer dust. After that, there was no running and turning, only knots and pairs of men chopping at one another in the dust with swords and throwing and pushing heavy lances at one another and blood running where the sword bit and the spear point hit. Mars, 
Mavors Marte Esto. I don't know how long it went on. I stood clutching the parapet of the platform. Maruna and other women with me, and women and children all stood on the roofs and the walls, watching men kill men. The snarling trumpets ran out again. A group of horsemen far out in the field moved forward in a solid mass like a shadow across the ripening crops and the pagus paths through the hot, slanting light full of dust. Before that mass, the lines and knots of fighting men gave way. Very quickly, the movement involved them all. They were turning and coming back to the city. The Volscians with their black horsehair crests, they were all running back towards the walls. Both armies, all the men down there in the fields, were running towards the walls in a cloud of dust that half hid them. Fine dust of the plowlands, billowing up brownish gold, sunlight making strange hollows and aisles in it through which loomed the shapes and shadows of horses and men. The city gates were open. They'd been open all through the fighting. I thought, I must go down and give orders that they'd be <coughs> shut. Maruna held my arm. I didn't understand why. I couldn't hear what she said to me. She put her mouth almost on my ear, crying, the guards will defend the gates. Stay here, stay up here. And as she drew away, something passed us perfectly silently and lay still on the platform. A bird, I thought, they shot a bird, but it was an arrow. It lay there with its long, bright bronze points and stiff clipped feathers, harmless. I couldn't hear anything because the noise down at the gate and the noise on all the roofs and walls of my city was so huge, a screaming, a howling that filled all the world and the mind. From the watchtower, we could not see what was happening at the gate. But we could see those who could see, standing on the walls above and near the gate. Some of them were watching their son or husband die, cut down by a bronze sword in front of the locked gate of his city. See, I put my heart into this book, ancient as it may be. Uh, okay, um, now, um, until Megan cuts us off, <laughs> we can do questions and answers, and I will answer any question uh, anybody wants to ask, if I can. I'll fake it if I can. <laughs> I, I, I wanted to ask. If you had any influence from Robert Gray's Homer's daughter? No. Well, <laughs> <laughs> the magic, you know, woman. Uh, the the influence of this book was incredibly <coughs> purely Virgil. I, I just it really is a riff on Virgil. I just took off from the Aeneid, which is a a very great poem. But f fair enough question. Yeah. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit about the process that you went through to get from this idea to words on paper and pulling this all together in a product? <laughs> I mean, aside from wanting to learn Latin, what did you do it? <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, <coughs> I was still looking through the Aeneid at 10 lines a day, you know, with my lobe edition, uh, the crib and the, the dictionary and all the rest of it. Uh, I was still plugging through Virgil when, when the book began to come to me. Uh, of course, I longed to translate, but uh, 
And let me say that of all the translations of the Aeneid, the two that that came anywhere near it to me are Dryden, if you if you know how to read 18th century poetry, 17th century, uh, and Fitzgerald. And the others don't make it to me. Uh, I know the Fagels is all the rage at the moment, but but the fact is, Virgil's an untranslatable poet, and, and uh, this was fairly clear to me early on. Uh, and so I think maybe this novel is my attempt to translate. I tr so what I did was translate a poem into a novel instead of translate poetry into poetry, in, in a sense. But how it came about, I don't know. Yes? Uh, why did you choose to write the first person? Uh, because she started talking to me. <laughs> it's, it was this girl, you know, hey, hey, you didn't let me say anything. <laughs> hey. <laughs> yeah. Were you already at work on this uh, three, four years ago when, uh, no, no. when the, some, somebody put out a call to contemporary authors to do, to do, um, um, a modern version of some mythological characters. Oh, that's always being done. Okay. I, I just got some sort of call to, you know, redo some mythological character. Uh, I was but, thinking yeah. the Penelope of Atlas. Well, I'm, I'm sure that was self-motivated. Uh, <laughs> uh, now, now uh, Atwood had a, she's got a scunner against Homer. I mean, she, uh, she was, uh, Atwood is kind of taking Homer on there. Yeah. Uh, which is not true of this book. You're not taking I'm not taking Virgil on. There's no reason to. Uh, he didn't, he, no, he doesn't give it Lavinia a look in in this one, but he couldn't. He had to tell the wars. It, it's what it seems to me. He certainly gave Dido a pretty good press, right? I mean, that's what most people know about the Aeneid, is the woman. And, and, um, you know, for a Roman, Virgil was uh, not a misogynist. He, he, uh, he, he had it okay. He, he, he doesn't need any reproving, I don't think. <laughs> there was somebody over here. Yeah. So, not knowing Latin, do you think it would be wise to try to read the Aeneid before reading your book? <laughs> before? Yeah, I mean... No, I don't know. It, it is... It is so disappointing in translation, in a way. Homer, Homer kind of comes through. I mean, you, you know, I don't read Greek. I don't know a word of Greek. And so I know I'm missing nine-tenths of it. But, but all the same, there, there's, there's kind of, again, I have to say Fitzgerald yes. for the Odyssey and the Iliad. Uh, and the Aeneid, the trouble with Virgil is that he is such a... Poet's poet. It is so. It, the music is just unbelievable. Even and I, I, I can't do Latin right, you know, but I can pick up a, a hint of the music, and it's just incredible. And you, you pretty you much know. start to the plot of the story the whole way through, and, you know, with embellishments. Yeah, and it's a good story. It it is a good story, and it, and and the the last half of it has not been taken. People have been fascinated with the whole Dido thing, the romantic part. And this is kind of the ugly part, in a way, uh, the last half. Yeah. I'm curious, because you were working from a poem and then going writing in novel form, were there formal tensions between the two genres at all, or was that not an issue for you? Or <clears throat> what did you do to deal formally with that musicality? <laughs> you could say one, th one thing that happened is that Virgil turns up in the novel. He does. He, he appears. He, he, uh, <laughs> Virgil comes and he talks to Lavinia. Uh, he is, at that point, he's, after all, lived, uh, even mythologically speaking, eight centuries after her. Um, but he, he turns up and, and he speaks to her, and he's... <laughs> you know, in the Middle Ages, they called him Virgil Magus, Virgil the Magician, because there's something enchanting about the influence he has on you when you read it. 
and uh, I absolutely believe they were right. And so, okay, he, he, you know, he shows up to Dante when Dante needs somebody to guide him to hell. Who shows up in Virgil, you know? <laughs> and, okay, he turned up <laughs> at my rather smaller uh, desk uh, and said, okay, okay, you know, what do you want to know? <laughs> So the, it is a translation. It was a translation from, from, from poem to novel, as I said, but it, which is a major translation. But it seemed to be OK. It seemed to be OK with Virgil, as far as I could tell. <laughs> yeah. You're such a prolific author. Does it get easier writing as, as the years go by, as the books get published? Well, it depends on what age we're talking about. Uh, I would say at 78, it doesn't. Uh, but er, before that, yeah, but pr practice makes makes easy, you know, yeah. The more you write, the more you write. It becomes a bad habit, you know. Or a good habit. Yeah. Uh, I did have to, I had to do more real true research than I usually do. You know, when I make stuff up, people are always asking me, what is your research? And I feel so embarrassed because I make it up. <laughs> but th this one, I, I did have to go to Portland State Library and, and uh, fish around a little bit in uh, particularly uh, early Roman religion and stuff like that, uh, and found absolutely wonderful books, totally fascinating. <clears throat> the trouble with research is you can get hooked on it, you know. Uh, and as for getting published, um, I have this really nice publisher, Harcourt, and my editor, Andrea Schultz, is here tonight for the launch of the book. And I didn't have any trouble with Andrea at all. <laughs> I'm lucky. No, no, my mother did, and and she wrote a couple, she wrote a bestseller or two. Uh, no, she she wrote you know page eighty nine and then page two. Yeah, she it's like she had it all in her on her head like Mozart. Have you got it all in your head, or do you just have the end? That uh, there is somebody, Kurt Vonnegut or somebody, had a name for that kind of writer that writes the separate bits and then connects them. And my kind, which is incredibly plodding, which is you write page one and then you write page two and then you write page three. <laughs> but if, if the book is in your head and you know how you're going to get to that great ending, roughly, go for it. Go for broke. It's the only way to write is always to go for broke. Yeah? Besides the research, do you find yourself in a different space when you're doing historical fiction, even if it's mythological versus um, fantasy science fiction where you're dealing with other worlds, other times, other places? Does this change the way you feel about how you write? Other worlds, other times, other places. What could be more different from us than 8th century Italy? <laughs> B.C. I mean, 8th century B.C. Uh, and I haven't ever been to this particular part of Italy. I wish I had, Latium, Lazio. Uh, so it's all imaginary, just as imaginary as some planet I make up. Um, I think science fiction and historical fiction are much closer together than most people realize. Uh, it's much, much the same kind of leap of faith and then getting things right. 
getting it to hang together, be coherent. Yeah. I feel like we're being all very proper and correct and asking you these great questions about how did you do this and how was your writing and I just wanted to tell you I love you. And <laughs> Well, uh, <laughs> love you too. <laughs> Believe me, a writer loves their readers. <laughs> should, should we close down there and, and sign books? <laughs> I guess a lot of people want books signed, so, so maybe, maybe we should. Thank you. You've been listening to the award-winning author Ursula K. Le Guin reading from her latest novel, Lavinia. Ursula Le Guin spoke at Powell City of Books in downtown Portland, Oregon, on April 22, 2008. To find out more about Ursula Le Guin and her work, please visit her website at www.ursulaklaguin.com. This program was produced by PDX Justice Media Productions. To find out more about this and our other programs, please visit our website at www.pdxjustice.org. You'll find programs featuring speakers such as Natalie Angier, Phyllis Bennis, Noam Chomsky, Susan Faludi, Rashid Khalidi, and many others. Thanks for tuning in. And thanks for supporting listener-sponsored radio, public access cable television, net neutrality, and all forms of grassroots, democratic, community media.